All right, Jimmy, where's Michael? Oh, he's still hanging out in the gift shop buying some more action figures? Of course he is. Anyway, we've got a few more minutes before he gets here to get everything ready and... What? I have to read another announcement from the board? (sighs) Okay, fine. Put me on the air. Quick announcement to our guests. The Russ Tamblin Extra Dry Martini will be discontinued at the end of the month. Turns out it's not as well liked as we had hoped. It was a reluctant entry to the drink menu. We are taking suggestions from our guests very soon on its replacement. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's get the show on the road. Live from Ogasawara, this is the Monster Island Film Vault, episode 25. Dogura, the space monster featuring Michael the Kaiju Groupie Hamilton. Hello, Kaiju lovers, and welcome to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast seeking entertainment and enlightenment through Tokusatsu. I am your host, the crystallologist curator of the vault, Nathan Marchand. But in yet another extended mini-analysis episode, I am joined by someone who is not only a friend of this podcast, he is also a patron for the podcast, and everyone's favorite kaiju groupie, Michael Hamilton. Welcome, Mike. Can I call you Mike? No, I prefer Michael because I used to go by Mike when I was younger, and... I don't know. I just prefer Michael, I guess. It just makes me sound a little bit older. You dislike Mike? Oh, shut up, Jimmy. Uh, I don't. Look, thank you, Jimmy, for bringing me here, but we can do without the back talk. Let's just say that. (sighs) Jimmy, come on. There's no room for that kind of language here on this podcast. Yeah, seriously, we're a family show, man. Knock it off. I mean, come on, Jimmy. Get it together. Anyway, speaking of coming to the island... I heard you were very excited about how Jimmy got you here. I was, I was, you see, I was talking with Jimmy on Twitter and like, I just threw out, Hey, why don't you pick me up in Serpentera? Not knowing that he actually has access to one. So egg on my face, but I was pleasantly surprised when that behemoth of a Mecca showed up at my house and scared the heck out of my cat. Yeah. That's impressive, Jimmy. I didn't even know you had Serpentera. I mean, I will admit, Michael, you are far more the Power Rangers expert than I am. But I have seen some of the archival footage of Serpentera. And that... I, I, Jimmy, how in the heck could it have fit in your garage? Oh, it's not the original Serpentera. I guess that would be right, because the first Serpentera was destroyed in large part because of a major design flaw, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, there was two Serpenteras that were destroyed, so I'm glad that Jimmy was able to pick me up in the in what he called the Mach 3. And I will have to give you this, Jimmy. It is a beautiful design, and especially the interior. I'm so happy that you ditched that steampunk red and chrome aesthetic. Well, I will hand it to you, Jimmy. You are one heck of an interior designer. Who provided the parts for Serpentera? Really? You did this for an unnamed client who's a friend of the board a couple of years ago before any of us came here? Well, before I came here anyway. So that's interesting. Do you even know who it is? You still don't know to this day. Interesting. Hmm. Sounds suspicious. I mean, a friend of the board? Eh, It could be a number of people. Yeah. Yeah, and... uh... The board and I aren't necessarily on uh, good terms right now. I'm a, I'm not sure what's keeping them from firing me, but uh, I'm going to keep riding that way for as long as I can. <laughs> well, when I first arrived here on the island, I was greeted by, uh, oh, shoot, what is that little, he's this little short guy, little short, bald glasses, uh, speaks with a really thick British accent. Anyway, he said he was some special envoy to the board. He, he came up to the port where uh, Serpentera was docked and decided to greet me personally. Not sure why, but he did provide me with, with a, a 20% off coupon for the gift shop. 
Oh, yes. I heard about that. That's why uh, it took you an extra couple of minutes to get here before the broadcast. And I figured, like, yeah, as soon as Michael finds the gift shop, we're going to have to pry him away from there, Mr. Collector. <laughs> I will say this. I was hoping for better deals in the gift shop, but, you know, given this island's location and how rare some of that stuff is, I mean, they have an exact replica of Frankenstein hand from Frankenstein versus Baragon. I'm not even sure how they were even able to get that. I'm not either. And sometimes, uh, let's just say, I think some of those uh, little gift shop items look a little too true to life. I have my suspicions. I mean, some stuff in there was so movie accurate, it almost actually looked like Frankenstein's real hand. I didn't touch it because it looked super creepy, and I was a little bit afraid it would jump up and get me, but yeah, I'm really shocked that they were able to get their hands on something like that. I know, that was an unintentional pun. Yeah, but congratulations on putting in the first one of the episode. <laughs> Well, I'm sure Jimmy's going to come up with a ton more than I, because he has a really uh, dry sense of humor, is the best way to put it. Yeah, let me tell you, I have to work with it every day. (laughs) I know all about it. I'm so sorry, man. I mean, I'm sure I got the lighter end of it all when Jimmy and I were having our not-so-cold war. (laughs) Let's not talk about that. Uh, Yeah, uh, that's a hatchet that I want to stay buried, which is interesting because this is technically your third time here at the island, but it's your first time on the show. It's kind of funny how that all works out. (laughs) Yeah, it's weird because my first adventure on the island was a complete mistake that wound up getting me quarantined. The second trip to the island was, I thought, a a vacation because... You know, Jimmy did promise an exclusive tour of the island that wound up being, let's just say, a lot more interesting than what I anticipated. I remember. (laughs) I was on Kaiju Weekly that week, so... (laughs) I know, you filled in for me while uh, you and Travis did Night of the Lepus, correct? Yes, Night of the Lepus. (laughs) Yeah, which was fun because I was able to snap that one shot of uh, Godzilla yes. and the only rabbit on the island. Yes, we do have one Lepus rabbit. It's a little strange. Mm-hmm. It's a good <laughs> thing you only have four though. Yeah, then it would be like having a swarm of giant tribbles. But <laughs> anyway, speaking of space, <laughs> you are here today to join me to discuss Dogura the Space Monster from 1964, which is not I wouldn't call it obscure, but it's not necessarily the most popular film in the Toho library. And Dogura is not popular here on the island, mostly because he's not here. I mean, he's gigantic. I don't think we could house him anywhere. <laughs> we would need the Serpentera Mark I to keep him in line. I mean, he's that huge. I mean, that's the only thing that I feel like could even match it in size and 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 to be fair dogra is probably even bigger in person than even what i saw on screen probably probably but in case anyone needs a quick refresher or if you haven't seen the movie this film is about a group of diamond thieves who are trying to get their next big heist and there's all kinds of shenanigans going on with that In the meantime, there are all these strange happenings going on where coal is being sucked out of coal mines and disappearing into the sky, and then the same thing that is eating the coal then starts going after diamonds, and there's an American diamond G-man who's pursuing this diamond heist ring and all kinds of stuff, and eventually when you get to the end, the two plots kind of crash headlong into each other in some crazy Yakuza parody shenanigans, pretty much. So <laughs> Yeah, not to be with the actual G-man, Jack. Yes, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> it's, he's not the diamond G-man, you know, unless he starts wearing a lot of bling. That, w- that would be amusing. <laughs> Sounds to me like just a typical Tuesday in Japan. <laughs> Yeah, the last thing you need is for G-Man to come back with some diamond brass knucks or something. Yeah. (laughs) I heard about that, Jimmy. So let me ask you, how long did it take you to recover from that black eye that uh, Jack gave you? Three days? I'm impressed. Or should I be? I I don't know. 
It's really impressive. As hard as I assume Jack hits, I assumed you would be stuck with that shiner for at least a week. Yeah, he tells me that Jack has one heck of a left hook. <laughs> but anyway... Oh, oh, oh. And a guy. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we're diving into today. I do want to remark that this was one of actually three kaiju films that Toho put out in 1964. If you want to talk about output. <laughs> what was the, the, wait, uh, wait, hang on. You said three? Three the in 1964 again? alone. What were the other two again? Mothra versus Godzilla and Ghidorah the Three Headed Monster. Never heard of them. You liar. <laughs> <laughs> dude you may want to cut that out because i think he's itching to start the cold war back up again <laughs> oh, calm not even down jimmy that. calm down i'm not even gonna pay one iota attention to you during this episode jimmy so you just need to can it <sighs> jimmy i told you about the foul language man this is a family podcast yes seriously you're going to have to start using the dump button for yourself at this rate. Anyway, he but is. yes, it was the third one. This was the second of the three. And Dogura is Toho's first space monster. He beat Ghidorah by a good couple of months, which Ghidorah is not very fond of, let me tell you. Yeah, it seems like that is ripe for an intense rivalry. Dogura versus Ghidorah. I would pay to see this. Yeah, except I think the only Ghidorah that would stand a chance would be uh, anime trilogy Ghidorah. But, you know, I know how you and a lot of other people feel about that. <laughs> well, we won't go there. Yeah. Admittedly, even though this isn't necessarily a classic, uh, Jimmy, weirdly enough, well, not weirdly enough at all, actually, uh, he's actually kind of fond of this one. He's a sucker for space monsters, and the, the opening of the movie actually reminds him of his early days at NASA back in the 80s. Oh, I didn't picture Jimmy as one for nostalgia. You'd be surprised. <laughs> but I do find it interesting at the, the beginning of the movie, my notes on this kind of go in chronological order of the film, just so you know. But I find it interesting that we're talking about space debris in this movie, and, uh, and I immediately thought of, yeah, Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla told us at the very last second that it was bad. <laughs> well, apparently that only applies when it's G-cells, though. Apparently. <laughs> but then you have a movie like Gravity that's all about the evils of space junk. So... <laughs> mm. That, that, that... Never mind. Forget it. I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> uh, I, I see where you were going. I see where you were going. <laughs> Yeah, none of that. See, none of that. None of that. I saw that weirdo little Twitter account that popped up about a month or so ago, and I am not touching that so-called podcast with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> Again, I could say so much there, but I choose not to because he's like, <laughs> it would be unfair for me to make a comment like that and complain to Jimmy about watching his language. Yes. <laughs> you hypocrite. Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about the title monster. I have a lot of notes here about the title monster. First of all, the design on Dogura is kind of insane. <laughs> it seems to be part jellyfish and part squid with huge heaping doses of Lovecraft thrown in for good measure. Because this thing is gigantic, it is otherworldly, and it is terrifying. Yeah, I mean, it really doesn't do a whole well i should say it does do a whole lot but it just kind of lingers up in the sky it doesn't fit in the typical mold that we picture japanese giant monsters right it's just sort of this gelatinous freeform creature which i will say that the original incarnation of dogra what we saw at the beginning of the film was actually a tad bit more scary than the space squid that we got throughout the rest of the movie yeah, I think it works in both forms, but for different reasons. The smaller ones, the, the ones that are supposed to be like cells, those are yeah. terrifying because we see what they can actually do. But the sheer size of the final form, if you want to call it that, and its very unearthly appearance, I think, like I said, lends a little bit of that cosmic horror to it. Yeah, one thing that I thought this film really did well was give us a very nice sense of size and scale for Dogra, uh, especially with some of the miniatures. Yeah, 
I also thought it was uh, really amusing that the that one part where they actually animated Dogra when he was smashing the bridge. That was, oh, that's my favorite scene. I know. It's, oh, it's, so like if this was MVM, that would be your standout effect award? <laughs> that would, yeah, that would be my standout effect award. Because, am, am I crazy? Because I swear when I saw that, like I had flashbacks to Disney movies. I don't know why, but I felt like that could have been a clip from a Disney movie. A very weird what, Disney movie, but a Disney movie. I was what kind of Disney movie are you watching, man? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't you like to know? I'm kidding. <laughs> so that was interesting. It's just the, the number of techniques. There was no suitmation in this at all. Dogoro was all animated or it was a puppet or it was marionettes. Yeah. It's yeah. really interesting to watch. Yeah, this film does a really good job. Now, some of these older films, they suffer from, especially if you watch them in fairly high definition, they suffer from being able to see some of the wires and things holding up the effects. But in this one, I looked for the wires. I, I could only find them one time, and that was when Dogra was, it was the first time he came to Earth as Dogra, and he starts tearing apart the smokestacks. And I could see the wires there once. And then the rest of the film, I, I would say, you know, for 1964, this is an extremely believable space monster. Yes, I would agree with you there. And I like the fact that, like I said, that he's so otherworldly. I mean, for a while, he's invisible. You don't even get to see him. His first real attack, unless you want to count when the, the smaller cells were causing problems at the beginning, the first real kaiju attack that we have with him is he goes after a coal mine. Well, not really a mine, mm -hmm. it's a coal field. He's sucking up all the coal, and you just see these little strands of coal getting picked up and flying into the sky and disappearing into clouds and then it starts to build up and then you have this tornado of coal flying up into the sky and it's nuts it is absolutely yeah, nuts and you can i mean i can tell pretty well how Subaraya did that it was all thanks to you know some reverse photography and all of that but even so it's impressive to watch yeah i i actually like it i think reverse photography or reverse videography in the right application looks really well done. I think there's a scene in, we talked about mega, I think we talked about mega Gears just now. Uh, maybe it was off cast. I'm not sure, but there's a scene in that film where they used reverse big reverse videography. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, Use your so words. <laughs> yeah. Words are so hard, man. I mean, I was in the lap of luxury up there in Serpentera, but Still, yeah, the jet lag. The jet lag was terrible. The jet um, lag is real. Anyway. <laughs> the jet lag is real. That is for sure. If there's a new uh, hashtag for you on Kaiju Weekly. Hashtag the jet lag is real. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, there's a really, I like it. I said all that to just say I like it when reverse videography is used well. Because I think that it's a, it comes off as a really nice effect. And in Dogra here, where the monster is sucking the coal up into the sky, I'm like you. I can see how Subaraya did it. It's just really impressive how it was implemented and how believable it looks. Yes. Now, I have to say, I mean, we've been singing the praises of Dogra this whole time. And there's some really, like I said, some really impressive sequences with him and everything. <sighs> Maybe I'm crazy. You can tell me if I'm crazy or not, but I feel like Dogra is the kind of monster that could have easily appeared on the original Star Trek. In fact, this predates Star Trek by a couple of years. Yeah, maybe, but I don't know. Maybe not in his squid or jellyfish form. Maybe in that sort of that more cellular form that we got at the beginning of the movie. It would have worked better because that part seemed like it would fit better in the original Star Trek because it was a little bit more, for lack of a better word, black hole-like. Yes. He's more uh, spacey. There we go. Uh, there's a new word for you. Spacey. Um, <laughs> Jimmy approves of this new word, apparently. Jimmy approves of any random word that m mashes together the word space. Yeah, like Space Godzilla. But moving on. <laughs> you were saying. Oh, I was just going to say that version of Dogra feels more like it belonged in the original Star Trek because that to me is a little bit more otherworldly than the squid jellyfish thing that we got later on in the film. In fact, like I said before, I kind of wish they would have stuck with that more because this monster without form is a lot more scary to me than a giant jellyfish thing. 
I can see that. And actually, now that I think about it, I think what you're saying is accurate because there is an episode of the original Star Trek that has a giant space amoeba. Mm. And I don't mean we and I don't mean the <laughs> the the Toho film. <laughs> but there is a giant amoeba in space. Yes, Jimmy. You you don't need to remind me, all right? Be quiet. <laughs> but yes, so it would be in keeping with that. But you know, I got to say, you know, all the praise that we've been singing of Dogra and uh this thing has a very unfortunate weakness. <laughs> <laughs> For well, all of its size and power and Lovecraftian terror, the dang thing is scared of wasps. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's kryptonite is wasp venom. There's an episode, I don't know if you've heard of Linkara or the YouTube show Atop the Fourth Wall. The, he's a, I've heard of it. Okay, I've he's heard a it. YouTuber who reviews bad comic books, and there he did an episode on this DC comic series that was this big crossover event with Wonder Woman as the big star. It was called Amazon's Attack, and there is a panel that he showed in his episode on it that became a running gag on his show for the longest time. Cause, and I don't even remember the exact context, but apparently somebody in this comic book had figured out how to weaponize bees. No joke because comics. <laughs> and there is a panel well, of Batman where when he realizes this, he just says, and I have to do it in the Batman voice. He goes, bees, my God. And <laughs> that's what I think of every time I watch this movie, except they figure out later, Oh, it's not bees. It's wasps. Right. What in so the heck? <laughs> so I'm going to assume that you guys are going to be okay. If Dogra was to ever come to the island, you guys are going to be okay because you've got that swarm of bees to protect you guys. See, I think it was, it's the same species that was brought over from the beta site that was featured in the animated Godzilla series. Am I correct? Yes. The, I forget what those things are called, but uh, yes, the, it was originally actually on the gamma site. But okay. it's the one species that's been allowed to be moved from the Gamma site because that's a different monster island. Onto the mm-hmm. beta sites, and they are on the verge of graduating onto the main site for that very reason, I have been told. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, it's safety precautions, man. I mean, I'm sure that your new safety officer, uh, your new head of security, rather, yep. probably had a good bit to do with that. Yes, Captain Gordon. Yeah, he has been studying a lot of kaiju that are not on the island. There are a few that aren't, including Dogura, and he's uh, taking safety precautions because he knows Dogura, that's uh, a worldwide threat right there. And uh, he's very familiar with dealing with planet-level crises. Yeah. Now, I'm assuming, Jimmy, that you have encountered something like Dogra in your travels, or have you in- actually have you encountered a Dogra before in your space travels? You may or may not have met Cthulhu during one of your space trips. And you live to tell about it. We'd be amazed what you can do. Right. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, seeing is believing, my friend. Seeing is believing. Anyway, moving on. Yes. It's. <laughs> I, I Every time I look at this, I keep thinking, I don't know if this is amazingly ironic or just lame. <laughs> I, I, I can't figure it out. I can see this just being lazy. Like, we'll get into it a little bit later. You know, Sekizawa and Honda are working on the script and they're trying to figure out how to defeat the monster. And someone just, I don't know, one of them got stung by a bee the day before or something and said, wait, what if the thing's allergic to bees? <laughs> <laughs> I can see Sekizawa coming up with that. It's like, it's weakness is that it's allergic to bees. <laughs> I wouldn't call it lazy. I would call it creative because, I mean, what other kaiju film out there do you know of that the monster is defeated by bees? I mean, this is really the only one I can think of. Well, technically uh, it's wasps. <laughs> I'd be glad well, I'm correcting you and not Jimmy because yeah, his, his yeah. finger was going for the button. I saw it going for the button. <laughs> <laughs> We've worked a lot with each other long enough that I know when he's reaching for the button. <laughs> yeah, it, it does seem maybe a little bit lazy, but I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily call it lazy, though. I would call it creative. Yeah. I would call it interesting, but I don't know if I would call it lazy. Yeah, I'm going with the irony <laughs> angle on this one where they just think, hey, what if this ridiculously overpowered thing had the lamest weakness, I guess you could say? <laughs> 
<laughs> the, uh, I mean, I don't want to call it lame, but it's just it's interesting that something that huge and terrifying can be defeated with wasp venom, which I mean, also that's... actually made me kind of stop and think, you know, because they uh, there's a sequence where people all across the world manufacture this stuff to use against Dogra. And I'm thinking, what's to stop these people from? Well, they, they do address it at the end of the movie, but I was thinking, it's like, what's to stop these people from using this weapon on people? Because wasp venom does <laughs> does wonders on human beings, too. I, you know. But oh, uh, yeah, then boy. they have the scientists who said, hey, I'm going to make sure this stuff gets used peacefully. Good on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, which made me think, though, how big is Dogra supposed to be? Because I got the impression that it was either as big as the Earth itself or it and its little uh, symbi- is it symbiotes that I'm thinking is the right word? Uh, it's clones. I think you're thinking are- of a different venom. Aha! Uh, <laughs> uh, it's number two. So I'm just curious because I was a little bit confused by the movie. Like I'm trying to picture in my mind how big Dogra actually is because I got the impression that it was Earth size. Well, thank you, Jimmy. I didn't realize that according to Wikizilla, the official stats on Dogra are micro to infinite. Well, that's good to know. That so sounds that sort of wonderfully nebulous. It was supposed to give you that impression, I think, that it was wonderfully infinite. Like this monster could be as big as your imagination could picture it, which, again, I wish they would have went with the more amoeba-like version of Dogra other than the giant space squid. Yeah, and again, it plays into the Lovecraftianness of this yeah, monster. But I'm not faulting it for that because, honestly, it's a well-executed piece of toku. It is. I would agree with you there. But still, he gets defeated by glorified pepper spray. <laughs> it's true. I'm not gonna it's let. True. I am not gonna let that go. Honestly, I think Jimmy could even stand up to pepper spray. I just have one more thing I'm gonna say about Dogra. <laughs> the uh, dried Dogra bits that start hailing down from the clouds once they start throwing more of the venom at him. They look like giant aquarium rocks. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I thought the same exact thing. That was another part of the film where I was a little bit confused. I was like, are these supposed to be crystals? They don't really look like crystals. They look like giant rocks that I would find in grandma's garden. Or uh, the little quote-unquote gemstones that they sell at gift stores. (laughs) Well, well, it's unique to say the least and does provide a bit of a humorous death for our villains, which is a great transition to go into because I do want to talk about the characters in this one. So I I neglected to mention at the beginning of this, this is another film directed by Ashiro Honda. So that means all three of Toho's kaiju films from 1964 were directed by Honda. (laughs) (laughs) And actually, all three of them were written by Shinichi Sakazawa. So all of our favorite classic Toho creative team members are here working on this movie. And I know a sticking point for this film that people have is they don't necessarily like the characters and they think the story's a little bit weird. And I will admit, it feels a bit like two movies that got mashed together. <laughs> like there were two different scripts. Like Sekizawa was working on a Yakuza movie parody and then working on another kaiju film. And then he just decided, you know what? I'll put them together and I'll figure out how to tie them together. Oh, wait, the monster eats carbon. So it'll eat coal and then it'll eat diamonds and the yakuza or the gangsters are trying to steal diamonds and i will conveniently forget to address the fact that humans are carbon-based life forms why isn't dogura eating people because carbon is people (laughs) (laughs) well all valid points all valid points and i thought the same thing because i know that we do have some carbon in our uh genetic makeup so i'm thinking to myself why isn't dogura trying to eat people But then I thought to myself, then if it was trying to eat people and as big as it is, there would be no people to try to stop it. So the movie would essentially be over at that point. Yeah. Or maybe he would have to eat all the coal and diamonds first. And then he'd be like, I need more carbon. Oh, the people. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Or humans just don't taste as good. Uh, maybe you know we give space monsters indigestion (laughs) i'm kind of hoping that we do so that i don't have to worry about being eaten by one 
But anyway, so let's talk a little about this. We have not only a lot of familiar faces behind the camera, but we have a lot of familiar faces in front of the camera too, not the least of which is our favorite Venusian or Martian, whichever you prefer, Prophetess Akiko Wakabayashi herself. And I gotta say, it seems like every other movie I have seen Miss Wakabayashi in, other than Ghidorah, she is allowed to be as pretty as she actually is. <laughs> <laughs> because you watch this movie or you watch her and you only live twice. And my goodness, is she a beautiful woman? <laughs> she definitely gives Kumi Mizuno a run for her money. Oh, well. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know you are far more of a Kumi Mizuno fan. Monster Zero, Miss Namikawa, whatever. You got a serious crush on her and you got a serious man crush on Nick Adams. I'm just saying. We're moving on from there. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, sometimes I think he worships at the altar of Monster Zero. It's a little terrifying. Well, by the time this comes out, our episode for Monster Zero will already be out. So I'll say thank you, Jimmy, for the wonderful feedback that you sent Kaiju Weekly for our Monster Zero episode. But you did play it a little bit too straight. So I was hoping for a little bit more of that, uh, that, old, that good old Jimmy humor. Saving it for Monster Zero. Gotcha. Apparently he has to send some stuff about Monster Zero too. So we have Akiko Wakabayashi, which was fun. And I actually like this human cast. All the gangsters are pretty fun. They look like they're straight out of a classic Hollywood movie. They're all wearing fedoras and suits and sunglasses. And the leader always amused me because he's got that uh, mirror Spock goatee of evil thing going there and the sunglasses and the, the speckles of gray in his hair. He looks great. <laughs> and they're clearly kind of riding the line between being competent and incompetent. <laughs> the only reason they're doing really poorly is because <laughs> their heists are getting interrupted by space monsters, which, by the way, you guys just talked about this has been making the news in the kaiju fandom, but this movie is the original kaiju score. Let's be honest. <laughs> 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 which listeners if uh, you're not familiar with that there's an upcoming comic book called the kaiju score and it's just got licensed for, to be a movie and it is about a bunch of thieves who are or they i don't know they're trying to rob a bank or something they're trying to pull a big heist while a kaiju is attacking a city that's the gist of it so <laughs> which is a really interesting concept we'll maybe touch on that later but i really enjoyed these characters that played the, the yakuza uh i hope i'm saying that correctly yeah the, or the, yakuza, the, the yakuza. Yeah. there we go but i really enjoyed the characters that were playing the yakuza they almost felt to me almost like a satire i couldn't take them as seriously in you can thank sekizawa for that the yeah, he yeah, was sure. uh he loved satire and humor and i think that was intentional on his part yeah, one of the reasons why I like Sekizawa's writing is because he does integrate some satire into it, which adds an extra layer to the films he works on. Yes, although as fun as all the bad guys are in this, there's one guy in this movie I think just steals every scene he's in, and that is Robert Dunham, the king of Cetopia himself. <laughs> <laughs> or emperor excuse me got to get the terms right the the emperor of Cetopia himself who here plays diamond g-man mark jackson <laughs> i did not know that was him until i started looking up the cast list for this film well and that's I because realized... you don't get to see that hairy chest in this movie i mean <laughs> That's true. That's true. And he had, he had, uh, he had much shorter hair in this film too. He did. But like I said, he just steals the show. Every scene he's in. I just love everything about this guy. I mean, he's, he is apparently a black belt in Kirk Fu because to go back to Star Trek because he karate chops everybody and it works. I knew that one move and that was the Kirk karate chop. <laughs> Yeah, it takes everybody out. And then hilariously, someone uses it on him later. <laughs> One of the bad guys gets him and karate chops him. <laughs> but the other thing that's really cool about his character is that, if, interestingly, he's actually from Massachusetts, but he was living mm. in Japan and he had lived there for long enough that he had actually picked up the language. So when oh, you're yeah. watching this subtitle, as we did today, that's actually him speaking Japanese. Oh, I know. It was it was really interesting. It was actually kind of jarring to watch an American speaking what sounded to be fluent Japanese because we don't get 
that a whole lot. I can only uh, him and well, I, the only, he's really the only American. Maybe one of the Kennys from from a Gamera movie could speak it too, but maybe that was just the dub. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Oh yeah, I forgot. You know that one of the Gamera kids could speak fluent Japanese, even though he was American, because it was you, or rather, he was playing you. Yes. My mind was so blown when you revealed that, my friend. Blown. Well, has that ever been officially confirmed, though, yet, Nathan? Is that really, Jimmy? Because I have my doubts. Well, that is a good... (laughs) Calm the heck down, man! Calm the frick (laughs) down, okay? Maybe you need to actually show us your lassoing skills. I'm just saying. But anyway, we're getting off track here. Jimmy's ridiculous backstory aside. Yes, it's rather impressive what he could do, being able to actually speak the language and not get poorly dubbed over like Jimmy's spirit animal, Nick Adams. (laughs) So, Michael, what's your favorite Mark Jackson moment in this movie? Aside from being Kirk karate chopped? Yes. It's got to be the moment where he puts his shoes under the curtains. That it was clever. I thought that was very clever. It, that was a really clever moment, and it it actually had me fooled there for a hot second. Yeah, mine has to be the <laughs> the, the party gun, confetti gun. <laughs> partly, oh, yes. partly and, because uh, Jimmy pulled that one on me once when I tried to play with what I thought was his laser pistol. Took <laughs> he took me out to his secret gun range here on the island, and he said, "Here, try it out." And I pulled the trigger, and yeah, I was a little upset. <laughs> He keeps promising to show me that gun range because I know how to shoot a pistol. You know, being from West Virginia, not Kentucky, just throwing that out there <laughs> to the board who's listening. Yeah, so I know how to shoot a pistol, Jimmy. So if you ever want to take me out to the gun range while I'm here, I can show you my skills. You can make that happen. Hmm. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And I, you know, we may even bring Marchand out there and uh, do a little shooting contest. Don't you dare compare my aim to that of a stormtrooper. You jerk. (laughs) I've never seen you shoot, Nathan, so I can't judge whether or not Jimmy is being accurate or facetious. Well, if he would give me a proper laser pistol, he would have a better assessment. But that being said, while we're on the subject of Mark Jackson, he's obviously, to use the MVM term, he wins our coolest character award, I'm guessing. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but it shouldn't be surprising then that Dunham actually went to Toho and tried to get him to make a non-kaiju spinoff for Mark Jackson. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all because he was a fun character. I, I will say that he was a really fun character. And, and really, I enjoyed him more than even some of our m- more veteran Toho actors. The funny thing is that spinoff obviously never happened, but some think it led to a 1967 movie called The Killing Bottle. <laughs> Yes, I know. It starred Nick Adams. (sighs) What is his deal with Nick Adams? It's borderline unhealthy at this point. Yeah, let me tell you. I think it really just boils down to the fact that he played Glenn, and Glenn trained him at NASA, apparently. My theory is I think Jimmy's just jealous of Glenn. (laughs) Jimmy, you do realize the board banned duels, right? Well, I mean, Jimmy, if you really want to do one, I mean, I I can oblige. Let me tell you. I don't know. That may not be a really good idea. I would assume, because I'm a little bit out of practice anyway, so I'm going to probably back off here. Smartest thing he's done all day? Sure. Anyway, so there's that. But MIFV would not be complete, even in a mini analysis, without talking about some toku topics, so to speak, with this. Because, yes, as usual, I do way more research on these films than anyone has a right to do. <laughs> it's, it keeps you employed because you have to write blogs, Jimmy. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, I did want to bring up, we talked about the coal consumption in this. You know, Dogre eating the coal. It does tap into a real-life issue in Japan, which is energy independence. They have to import most of their energy because they're an island nation and they have very few of their own resources. But if I remember correctly, coal is actually one that they can mine themselves. You might remember Rodan. They had coal mines in that. Yeah, I uh, I remember that. 
And that's why nuclear power is such an issue in Japan. Well, obviously because of Japan's history with nuclear things. But it's also because Japan is disaster prone, especially on the east coast of Japan, because that's where a lot of typhoons and tsunamis hit. Right. And they built nuclear power plants along the coastline so they could use the water to keep the generators cool. But just like we saw with Fukushima, you do that, it's kind of a catch-22 because you do that and then you risk them being damaged and then disasters start happening. Now, it's safer on the west side because there isn't nearly as many of those things occurring on that side. But because of Fukushima, Japan actually shut down most of its nuclear power plants because they wanted to avoid another disaster like that. But at the same time, it was also the most viable source of energy for them without having to import it all. Yeah. From what I know, uh, where even I live, I think we export a lot of coal to Japan. My dad even talked about when I was younger how a lot of the coal exported from my state goes to Japan. So it's, it's really interesting. But that's just the little tidbit that I found out about such things. The big thing I wanted to mention in here, since we've already made mention of it, is the Yakuza. A.K.A. the Japanese Mafia. Yes, although, interesting thing, it is and isn't what you think it is, from what I mm -hmm. was looking into. It's a 400-year organization, for one thing. Did you know, Michael, that the name Yakuza actually comes from a card game? No, I did not, Nathan. <laughs> There's a card game called Oicho Kabu, and it's similar to a game called Baccarat. I don't think I've ever played Baccarat. Have you played Baccarat? I Baccarac? actually have played Baccarat before. Okay. Yeah. So you have point values for your hands based on the mm -hmm. final digit and the hand score. And right. if you get a hand of eight, nine, and three, which equals 20, it is worth zero points. So it's the worst hand that you could get. And the Japanese uh, words for eight, nine, and three are Yakuza. <laughs> respectively, which became the word Yakuza, which means worthless or pointless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure that many in that organization would beg to differ with you. Probably, but I read that and I thought, someone needs to write a parody with an organization called Yahtzee. Thank you, Jimmy. If you weren't going to do it, I was going to ask you to. You and I are going to have words after today's broadcast. Moving on. There's several different origins for the Yakuza from what I was seeing online. <laughs> There's a few, yeah. Some of the earliest members of the Yakuza, interestingly, were the Burakumen. Uh, do you remember me talking about the Burakumen in episode 11, Michael, I on do, Varan? I do not. Oh. I'm sorry that I don't. To quote a great man, you make me sad. <laughs> But anyway, so they were some of the earliest members to join. If you want to know more about the Barakuman listeners, go back and listen to episode 11 again. But to put it succinctly, they are the lowest social caste in Japan, and they were for many, many centuries. So when laws were passed against the Barakuman in 1603, they turned in desperation to lives of crime. Things like theft and smuggling. They even, you want to talk about kind of crazy. They even had gambling houses and abandoned shrines and temples. And I just Hang talked on. about shrines and temples in the last episode. <laughs> That's really interesting. Cause, yeah, because I remember you talking about, because you're in the middle of this uh, uh, Daimajine yes. trilogy. So it's really interesting that that even comes up again. Yeah. However, some of the gangs actually prefer telling you a more noble version of their origin, which is that they descended from honorable Robin Hood-like characters, you know, a lot of whom were samurai, who defended their villages from bandits. And they can trace their origins to ronin, which were samurai without masters. Mm -hmm. And then others claim that they came from what were called Kabuki Mano or the crazy ones. And there were these wildly dressed hoodlums who carried swords and intimidated whole villages and sometimes executed civilians for no reason. I don't know why you would want to trace your origins to what sounds like a gang of jokers, but sure. Well, it sounded to me like they started out sort of as a gang of anti-heroes. So I'm wondering how over time they evolved into this notorious crime organization. It took a little while, but as time went on, they actually started forming into something like that. The structure of a Yakuza gang is actually a lot like a family. The relationship that a Yakuza boss has with his underlings is described as uh, Oyuban and, uh, slash Koban, which means foster father and foster children. 
Mm-hmm. And that's why a lot of these people were turning to that because they were social outcasts and they were finding the family that they didn't have in the Yakuza. Mm-hmm. Did you ever watch the Ninja Turtles movie growing up? I did, yes. I was thinking of that movie when I was researching this. Specifically, Mm -hmm. the part that is honestly, I think, probably the best scene in the entire movie when Shredder comes in. And I mean, it's easy to parody, but he comes walking in and he tells all these kids he's addressing. He says, we are a family. I am your father. You know, so I mean, it's like I said, it's a little bit funny, (laughs) but it totally makes sense now. Let's be honest. He more or less made a Yakuza gang out mm-hmm. of those kids. That's what the Foot Clan is. It's a Yakuza gang. At least it's structured right. like one, it seems. It's sort of a manufactured family, whereas even with what, uh, like Sicilian uh, mafia gangs are oftentimes literal blood family, but these are sort of a manufactured sort of gang of, I would say, just I would, I would, I'm imagining like a gang of misfits yes. just coming together because they're just sort of lost and they need a purpose. Yes. And interestingly, they do live by a code. So I guess you could call them honorable thieves if you wanted to. It's something called the Ninkyo Code, Mm -hmm. which according to an author named Manubu Miyazaki, who's written over 100 books about the Yakuza and other minority groups, this code forbids the Yakuza from letting others suffer, which is a little ironic given what the Yakuza is involved with. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but he mm-hmm. says, Yakuza are dropouts from society. They've suffered and they're just trying to help other people who are in trouble. Right. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting for sure. I know it'd probably be diving into some parts of like psychology and human nature a lot deeper than probably what we have time for for this episode. Yeah. But, uh, it's interesting how a lot of these crime families and a lot of these gangs, like let's bring it up to sort of modern day where it, you've got the Crips, the Bloods and the uh, what is the one, uh, the Latin Kings. I mean, they're known to be a very dangerous gang, but they do sort of have this code of honor within their ranks. And I find that really interesting because a lot of folks will picture sort of these gangs as being just merciless killers. They just rob, steal, and do whatever they have to do to make a quick buck. But a lot of them do have a very strict sort of code of conduct within their ranks. Yeah, and very strict rules about loyalty. They have very strict codes Mm -hmm. on loyalty, I should say. Right. And if you break those, if you disgrace the gang, or Mm. if you're disloyal to the gang, they have a very famous punishment for that. You have to cut off the fingertip of your left pinky. And there's actually a practical reason for that, or it stems from a practical application, Mm -hmm. which was the more fingertips that they would lose, the less proficient they would become with a sword, which would in turn make them more dependent on the gang for protection. Yeah, that makes sense. And the Yakuza are also really known for being covered head to toe in crazy tattoos, I found out. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the pictures I found of Yakuza members, they're covered with tattoos pretty much everywhere except their face. It is crazy. Yeah. And these are a type of tattoo that in Japan are called Irazumi. And a little uh, quotation I have here from one of the articles I looked at said, they typically depict clan symbols, nationalist images, or scenes of traditional Japanese glory, such as samurai Mm. warriors. Yakuza wear these tattoos as symbols of the Yakuza's outsider status and his lifelong pledge to the clan. I'm wondering if sort of like how how gangs here like certain tattoos indicate certain things like i think it's a spider on your elbow indicates you've done time a tear on your face means you've killed somebody i'm wondering if any of the tattoos that they're getting are in reference to something during their gang life or coming up in that organization It's that, possibly, but I think it also is indicating beliefs because the Yakuza do have ties to, from what I was reading, to nationalist politics in Mm -hmm. Japan, and they also claim to have ties to samurai, so they're using that symbol as well. Mm. It could be a lot of things, honestly. Yeah. And the Yakuza, they've gotten involved in a lot of things over in Japan. Like I've mentioned before, they've done theft and smuggling. They've also gotten involved in human trafficking, unfortunately. They are known for going to places like South America, Eastern Europe, the Philippines, and they lure young women into prostitution. Okay. And then another 
bit of their bread and butter is the drug trade. Most drugs that are run in Japan are by the Yakuza. In particular, well, makes- meth. Although one very mafia-like thing that they've been doing for many, many years, actually for centuries now, is protection money. That's a stereotypical mafia thing that, that yeah. you see a lot. Yeah, and a lot of businesses serve as fronts for them, particularly when it comes to the human trafficking. So uh, uh, brothels get disguised as massage parlors, karaoke bars, love hotels. I'm a little scared to find out what that is. <laughs> well, it probably the name of it probably speaks for itself. Yeah, it does. But... In the last 30 years or so, the well, 40 now, because you know this goes back to the 80s, they've also been getting involved with more white-collar sort of crime, particularly with real estate. There's a particular branch of Yakuza that are called Jigea, and they demolish stuff in residential areas for real estate companies so they can develop them. Interesting. And then if the landowners are giving them trouble, they use classic extortion and intimidation to get stuff done. And apparently the Japanese government just kind of lets them do it because they don't think they could do any development on those sites without them. There are now 50 registered companies that have deep ties to the Yakuza and organized crime. But also because of that, a lot of Yakuza have been getting involved in the stock market. So they're making legitimate money that's not illegal. And a lot of them have started to kind of pull back away from the crime so they can do that. It's also because there's been a lot of laws passed over the last 30 years to crack down on the Yakuza to the point where, from what I was reading, their membership numbers have dropped drastically, and it's probably at an all-time low right now. Although, from what I read, some analysts estimate that there are about 80,000 members of the Yakuza in Japan. Oh, wow. I don't know how recent that number is, because that still sounds fairly high to me. Yeah, I mean, if they're all sort of turning, well, I won't say all, if they're sort of in the process of turning legitimate, that number does seem a little bit high. But, I mean, I don't know. It, it's really hard to tell. Well, and then the the other thing that kind of compounds this, and I think this might actually contribute to the fact that we didn't see it in this movie, but we there's plenty of films out there, like uh, the Kurosawa movie from 1948, Drunken Angel. That's actually considered a Yakuza Ega. Like, you know, we talk about Kaiju Ega. That's Yakuza uh-huh. Ega, a Yakuza movie. A lot of the times they do get venerated as heroes, even if they are violent and despicable at points. Right. But I think contributing to that are the fact that in recent years, the Yakuza have been making humanitarian gestures for 311. The Yakuza actually sent 70 trucks with relief supplies to the city of Tohoku, Uh and they actually got there before the first responders. Now, some people think that they're doing this as an outpouring of the fact that they know what it's like to be ostracized, but other people think it's just a PR stunt. I would probably be in the camp of thinking it would more like just a PR stunt, just to project some kind of goodwill toward the community. Yeah, I don't know anybody who was in the Yakuza, nor have I been in the Yakuza, so I can't really comment on that. For all we know, Jimmy's probably in the Yakuza. No, but you may have a Japanese friend who is in there. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I mean, that's one other reason why I don't really want to mess with Jimmy right now, I guess. Smartest thing he said all day? Okay. Well, that's two things. So, all right, I'm good in Jimmy's book today, I guess. Apparently. But anyway, there's a lot more I could go into because, like I said, I tumble down research holes when I prepare for this podcast. But I'll have to defer a lot of these to Jimmy for his notes. Would you say for this episode you went the full march and or just the halfway march and? More like the two thirds march and (laughs) the three quarters march and. (laughs) I didn't look up as many articles as I normally do, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, trust me, I get a little carried away. Uh, just a touch. Like I said, it gives Jimmy some job security. But I do have some housekeeping items to take care of as we wrap up this episode, one of which is some listener feedback. First, we have yet another Apple Podcast review. This one comes to us from username Lucha Kaiju, who also just started following the show on Twitter. Title of it is Awesome Podcast, five stars, because... We all know, Michael, you have to give five stars, even if you criticize the podcast. That's true. Criticize the podcast all you want, but at least give us five stars worth. Yes. 
And he writes, a great mix of informative and entertaining, this show is up there with the best of the growing library of kaiju podcasts. A strong feature is the situating of the kaiju films in sociological and historical context to fully flesh out the meaning of the films, enriching the appreciation and understanding of them. All without being dry or boring. A tall order, well done, a great show. Thank you very much, Mr. Lucha. That was a really splendid review. Yes, I love getting these reviews. I would definitely say that the show is not dry. Yes, we work very hard at that. <laughs> and then I have a quick little bit of feedback here from Kyo Toshi, who I think listens to every kaiju podcast in existence. <laughs> and she's doing a little bit of follow-up from our Atragon episode. She writes, Hi, the rising sun flag is still used by the Maritime Self-Defense Force, just like in the Great Pacific War, and the Ground Self-Defense Force uses a modified version. Injecting myself here real quick. She's writing because I had mentioned that Jinguji had the old wartime flag up at his base. Oh, okay. Yeah. She continues, The rising sun flag has always been the flag of the armed forces, but the Hinomaru, the red disc on white background with no rays, has been Japan's national flag since 1870. Thank you very much, Kyoe, for that clarification. (laughs) And with that, we come to a very important segment of the show, the Patreon shoutouts. Go show! Travis Alexander, host of the Kaiju Weekly Podcast. Eh, some guy named Michael. Wait, huh? You heard me. Moving on. Eli Harris. Also, Eli Zilla 13 on Instagram. Chris Cook, host of One Cross Radio. Bex from Redeemed Otaku. Nice job, Michael. It is a lot more fun doing this with the guests, let me tell you. Yeah, I thought so, too. I appreciate you letting me do it. Uh, I, ho- I really hope, though, that your Patreons, or your patrons, rather, enjoyed it more than even us going back and forth here. All right. And actually, speaking of patrons, <laughs> we have some more patrons showing up in our upcoming episodes. Ooh. Although our next episode is going to be the last of what I'm calling the Daimajin days. My friends Joe and Joy Metter will be returning for the final entry in the Daimajin trilogy, Daimajin Strikes Back. And Jimmy, you better not keep questioning Joy's sword fighting skills. I'm just saying. Hey, but lay off the button. And then he seemed like a very formidable fighter to me. And honestly, Nathan, I've really enjoyed your Daimajin reviews with the Metters, although I'm a little bit terrified of their dogs. Teddy Kong and Bitzilla? Uh, Bitzilla is not a problem. Uh, Teddy Kong is the one you got to watch out for. Gotcha. That's what I figured, but I wasn't quite sure. It is surprising that you guys let kaiju dogs into the studio. Don't they make a mess? They're not quite kaiju sized. That helps. Oh. But I think they think they're kaiju, something like that. They just lay kaiju-sized dumps. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) But as I was saying, speaking of patrons, your partner in crime over at Kaiju Weekly will be joining us next month for another extended mini-analysis. That being Travis Alexander himself, the biggest common Rider fan I know. <laughs> I mean, become- he is a huge common Rider fan. So, sort of like how Jimmy uh, has an unnatural fascination with Glenn. Travis has an unnatural fascination with common Rider that I've never quite figured out. I haven't either, but it's charming. I'm having it is him. Charming. Yes, I'm having him on to talk about Frankie V. Barry, aka Frankenstein Ooh. Conquers the World. <laughs> because Ooh, that's one hashtag, of my favorites. Yes, because hashtag justice for Baragon. Of course. <laughs> uh, Jimmy even got him a permit to sell those shirts here on the island with Baragon Jimmy, present. Jimmy, how did you get the board to approve that? Candy? Okay, whatever. Weird, but okay. All right. Do they have a particular one that they like? A hundred grand? Figuratively or literally? It sounds like literally, maybe? Like, I've, I've only been following the board for a few months now, and they seem pretty greedy. I'm allowed to say that because I don't actually work here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think my contract somehow has a clause that keeps them from 
giving me too much grief. I don't know how. You got that added for me? Well, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that. Well, that's really nice of you, Jimmy. I don't ever want to hear Nathan say that you've never done anything for him. Well, you know, he is sort of ungrateful. I get that, but hey. still. Oh, come on, Nathan. You you need to learn how to take a joke, man. I mean, you've worked with Jimmy this long. You ought to know what it's like to work with a clown. <laughs> I know, because I am one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you said it, not me. You said the quiet part out loud, my friend. You're not the only one who's called me a clown. I'm just saying. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. And then one last thing I want to mention to everybody. September is our first anniversary. So next week... Danny DeMana and I will be hosting an anniversary special that will feature a remastered, yes, we're pulling a George Lucas, on our presentation from Kaiju Con Line in July called The Original MCU, where we're going to be talking about Showa-era continuity. Not only that, we will be reading and also playing feedback from all of you about your favorite moments from the first year of the show. And I can't begin to tell you how excited that makes me, Michael. I can't believe I've been at this for a year. <laughs> I can't believe you've been at this for a year either. I mean, mad props to you, man. If For anyone who can put up with Jimmy for this long has got some intestinal fortitude. Let's just say that. Thank you. <laughs> I've been strengthening my intestines for the entire year. You should see <laughs> what I have to eat to do it. <laughs> well, from what Jimmy told me on the ride over here, the cafeteria food's not great, so I'm sure that your intestines have gotten a, a workout. Most definitely. I've had some flashbacks back to college, man. Cafeteria pizza? Man, that's... Ooh, boy. I just thinking about it, it just makes me shudder. But no, I am looking forward to that, man. I mean, the to think that you guys have been at this for a year at this point is really awesome. I'm just a guest here, but I'm going to say great job. Great job with everything. Hey there, audio listener, Michael here. So I'm hijacking the podcast just for a hot second because Nathan forgot to let me do my shameless plugs. So if you want to find my podcast, it's the Kaiju Groovy Podcast. You can find that on wherever you find your favorite giant monster and tokusatsu podcast, just like this fine show. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Kaiju Groovy Pod, on Instagram at The Kaiju Groupie, and on Facebook at The Kaiju Groupie. I run a little Facebook group there. Also, you can find me every week on another little podcast called Kaiju Weekly, along with my good friend travis alexander so there we go thank you guys for listening and i guess i'll see you next time hey hands off my new mic oh crap all right thanks a lot man and with that cue credits jimmy thank you for listening to the monster island film vault a podcast produced and hosted by nathan marchand if you enjoy the show and want to join the discussion, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at feedback at monsterislandfilmvault.com. Your message could be read on a future episode of the show. Our website is monsterislandfilmvault.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Monster Island Film Vault and on Twitter, where our handle is TheMonsterIsla1. You can also follow Jimmy from NASA on Twitter at NASA Jimmy. I have fulfilled my contractual obligations. The podcast logo was created by Tyler Souls from TylerDrawsComics.com. Our theme song is Wander on the Offensive, live edit by B33J, Sarax, Juan Madrano, and Nonsensical Lexus, which is a remix of Counterattack, Battle with the Colossus, and The Open Way, Battle with the Colossus by Koatani from the video game Shadow of the Colossus. It can be downloaded from ocremix.org. All film and audio clips belong to their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and other fine podcasters. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts to spread the word about the show. You can also support MIFV on Patreon. The Monster Island Film Vault is a Moonlighting Ninjas Media production. Sayonara! <laughs>
So, Jimmy, now that Nathan's gone, I don't know where he took off to. I think he said he was going to the bathroom. Anyway, um, I got a favor to ask you. I have been staying the vents there. Would it be possible on the way home that I could drive Serpentera? I mean, are you sure? I mean, it's not a big deal, Jimmy. Come on. I mean, you built the darn thing. No, Jimmy. I have driven things before. I mean, it can't be any different than driving a car. Oh, come on. You owe me this. Given our history and everything that you put me through personally, I mean, Jimmy, you almost blew up half my house when you went after that fake compendium. You owe me this. All right. Well, I really appreciate it. I know you don't always give this privilege to your guests, but again, like I said, I thought maybe you could make an exception for me, you know, given our history and all that. And I promise I'll do my best, unlike somebody I know, to not blow anything up.